A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 20th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. Today we have 8 different news articles from yesterday's and today's newspaper. So without much delay, now let us get into the first news article discussion. Take a look at this article from yesterday's newspaper. It talks about the newly introduced Digital Personal Data Protection Bill. Here note that this draft bill has been brought as a replacement to the earlier withdrawn Personal Data Protection Bill 2019. The earlier bill was withdrawn in the month of August due to multiple amendments proposed to it by a joint parliamentary committee which scrutinized the bill. During the withdrawal of the bill from the parliament, the Minister for Electronics and Information Technology has said that a new bill will be introduced encompassing the amendments proposed to the Personal Data Protection Bill 2019. So as a result of this, the new draft bill called Digital Personal Data Protection Bill has been now thrown open for public comments till December 17, 2022. So this is the background of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the newly introduced Digital Personal Data Protection Bill. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. Firstly, let us see the need for data protection bill. Why do we need it? See, with even increasing online data which is being generated by the public due to increasing usage of the internet, there has to be a necessary mechanism to regulate the entities who are handling this data. So, this is where the data protection law becomes important. It keeps a check on the companies which are handling personal data on a large scale and protects the privacy of the people. Now, this need for more robust data protection framework came to the spotlight in 2017. This was due to the Supreme Court's landmark judgment in Justice K.S. Puttaswamy vs. Union of India that established the right to privacy as a fundamental right. See, this case is very, very important. Since data protection bill is frequently in news, you can either write this in your main answer or you can expect a preliminary question from this. So what the judgment of this case said? In this judgment, the court called for a data protection law that can effectively protect users' privacy over their personal data. Consequently, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology formed a committee of experts under the chairmanship of Justice B.N. Sri Krishna to frame a draft data protection law. This draft protection law given by the committee got revised and it became the Personal Data Protection Bill 2019. But as I said earlier, there has been numerous amendments proposed to this bill by the Joint Parliamentary Committee due to which the bill was withdrawn. This is all with respect to the Personal Data Protection Bill 2019 and its background. Now let us shift our attention towards the newly introduced draft of Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022. Here we shall see some important provisions in the new draft bill alone. Firstly, know that the earlier version of the bill had recommended that a data protection authority to be set up to prevent misuse of personal information. The revised bill has instead proposed a data protection board of India which will be notified by the central government. Here note that this data protection board of India will function as a regulatory body and it has power to impose a penalty of up to rupees 500 crore if non-compliance by a person or entity is found to be significant. Okay. So this is about the regulatory body proposed to be set up by the union government mentioned in the article. Secondly, the new bill has watered down the provisions relating to data localization. Here, data localization is the practice of keeping data in the region it came from. Okay? The earlier bill proposed transnational companies to store data generated in India within the borders of India. This provision has been done away with in the new draft bill. See here, you have to remember one thing. Most countries mandate data created within their borders to remain stored within its borders. See, such stringent laws will allow the government and their law enforcement agencies to work more efficiently. 
but it will ultimately result in hindrance of global trade and increase the operational cost of businesses. So the move by the government to dilute the provision relating to data localization has been appreciated in the business circle. Now moving on to see the third important provision relating to the new bill. The new bill has introduced the concept of consent managers in the bill, pointing out that it is not always possible to keep track of the instances in which one has given consent to the processing of personal data. The government said that a consent manager platform will enable an individual to have a comprehensive view of her interactions with data fiduciary and the consent given to them. Here the term data fiduciary refers to any person who who alone or in conjunction with other persons determines the purpose and means of processing of personal data. This is all with respect to the provisions relating to consent present in the new draft bill. Now let us see the provisions relating to exemptions mentioned in the draft bill. Here note that the new bill gives special power to the government to offer exemption from the provision in the bill in the interest of sovereignty and integrity of India and to maintain public order. Finally, the new bill makes it obligatory for the data demanding entities to make sure that the request for consent to be presented in a clear and plain language. So this is all with respect to the newly introduced Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022. I hope through this discussion we learned about the importance of data protection mechanism, the earlier introduced Data Protection Bill 2019 the reason for its withdrawal and finally about the newly introduced Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. See this article here, the news is that Indian National Center for Ocean Information Service, in short called as INCOIS, is closely watching the volcano on the barren island of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The volcano is being closely watched to check for signs of an eruption which could lead to a tsunami or a monstrous undersea landslide. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn few facts about the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services in COIS. Since it is frequently in news, knowing about this organization is very very important. So make note of this. Know that INCOIS is an autonomous organization which is functioning under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. It was established in 1999 and the organization is located in Hyderabad. Remember, INCOIS is a unit of the Earth System Science Organization ESSO which is based in New Delhi. INCOIS is mandated to provide the best possible ocean information and advisory services to society, industry, government agencies and the scientist community. Now let us see some of the major functions of INCOIS one by one. Firstly, INCOIS provides round the clock monitoring and warning services for the coastal population regarding tsunami, storm surges, high waves, etc. Now, if you are wondering how INCOIS could do that, INCOIS provides such services through Tsunami Early Warning Center, in short called as ITEWC. This also functions under INCOIS. Secondly, INCOIS provides daily advisories to fisher communities to help them easily locate areas of abundant fish in the ocean. This helps the fishers to save both fuel and time which is used to search for the fishes. Now this advisory provided by INCOIS is called Potential Fishing Zone Advisories. They are issued in Hindi, English and 8 vernacular languages. And these advisories are given through SMS, village information centers, local radio, local TV, etc. Okay, now moving on to the third function. INCOIS deploys and maintains a suit of ocean observing system in the Indian Ocean. These systems will help to collect data on various oceanic parameters to understand the processes in the ocean and to predict their changes. Now fourthly, INCOIS provides short term ocean state forecast that is for 3 to 7 days about the wave currents, sea surface temperature etc. The forecast are issued daily to the fisher community, the shipping industry, the navy, the coast guard etc. 
remember these forecast inform users about the expected sea conditions during the next few days and this will help them to plan their activities at sea fifthly encois archives all observational satellite and other oceanic data at the so encois data center encois also makes such data available to students researchers and any other users now finally encois provides training and capacity building for students and young researchers in india and in indian ocean rim countries see the training is given through short and long duration training courses at the international training center for operational oceanography which was established at so encois so that is all you have to remember about encois very very important news article discussion make note of all these points if you could remember all these points and present it in your answer paper your paper will appear enriched so in this news article discussion we saw in detail about encois it is nothing but an autonomous organization which functions under the ministry of earth science it is a unit of the earth system science organization so which is based in new delhi its mandate is to provide the best possible ocean information and advisory services to society industry government agencies and the scientific community then we saw six major functions of encois one by one so with these learned points in mind now let us move on to the next news article discussion Now take a look at this news article it talks about a new initiative by Chennai Metropolitan Water Supply and Sewage Board CMW SSB the initiative is nothing but the board introduced a QR code based facility to receive complaints from the residents of its service area so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn some of the important points about the e governance initiatives in India Now before starting our discussion we'll briefly see about the importance of e-governance. E-governance improves the transparency of the government institutions since it reduces the direct contact of government officials with the citizens it reduces the chances of corruption. Secondly it promotes the efficient delivery of government services to the citizens in a time bound manner. example for this we'll see further in the discussion and lastly it promotes the coordination between the different levels of government so these are all some of the advantages of e governance so knowing this let us see some of the recent e governance initiatives by the government firstly let us take the case of my gov website and the mobile app see this my gov has been established as government of india's citizen engagement platform which collaborates with multiple government bodies and ministries to engage with citizens for policy making my gov also seeks the opinion of people on issues or topic of public interest and welfare here note that my gov is part of digital india corporation which is a section 8 company under ministry of electronics and it government of india You as aspirant must have a look at this wonderful website. You can see a wide range of activities going on in there. Now moving on to the next initiative. This is about a state specific e-governance initiative. Here I'm talking about Bhumi. Bhumi is a project jointly funded by the government of India and the government of Karnataka to digitize the paper land records of Karnataka. The project was designed to eliminate the long-standing problem of inefficiency and corruption in the maintenance of land records. The project development and implementation are done by National Informatics Center. So this is about the second initiative, Bhumi. Now moving on to the third initiative called Faster, F A S T E R. See the previous two initiatives we saw were from the executive's side. but this initiative is from the judiciary yes this e governance mechanism was introduced by the former chief justice of india n v raman here faster stands for fast and secured transmission of electronic records the platform would be used by the government officials to instantly send e copies of the orders through a secured electronic communication channel to intended parties These orders may vary from stay of execution of a person to freeze on the demolition of a slum to bail orders for under trial prisoners. 
Normally, bail orders take a long time to reach the prison officials, right? But through the usage of faster, the time taken for the transfer of bail orders has been brought down. So this is about the initiative faster. Now let's move on to see MCA 21. See, this is a flagship initiative by the Corporate Affairs Ministry. The project aims to provide electronic services to the companies registered under the Companies Act. Various online facilities offered includes allocation and change of name, incorporation, online payment of registration charges, change in address of registered office, then viewing of public records and other related services. So this is about MCA 21. Now finally we will see about DigiLock. See DigiLocker is an initiative of Ministry of Electronic and IT that is MAITY under Digital India program. DigiLocker aims at digital empowerment of citizen by providing access to authentic digital documents to citizens digital document wallet. The issued document in DigiLocker system are deemed to be at par with original physical document as per Rule 9A of the Information Technology Rule 2016. You can digitally store most of the government certificates in this app. For example, rather than carrying your driving license physically to where you are going, you can store it in your DigiLocker account digitally. And this can be accessed through the DigiLocker mobile app. So this is about the digi locker. So that's all about this news article discussion. So through this discussion, we saw five different e-governance initiative of the government. All these initiatives were brought up with an aim to improve the transparency of the government institutions. So with these learned points in mind, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. This news article is about the No Money for Terror NMFT Ministerial Conference. See, this is the third NMFT ministerial conference. This year, the conference was held on 18th and 19th of November. And this year, the conference was organized by our Ministry of Home Affairs. So, as the current chair of the NMFT, our Home Minister mentioned two things that have to be done to counter terrorism. The first thing is universal common definition of terrorism and terror financing. Second thing is, a secretariat must be established to ensure that NMFT becomes a permanent body. See, currently NMFT is just a temporary ministerial conference. Our Home Minister said that in order to ensure the continued global focus on countering the financing of terrorism, establishing a secretariat for NMFT is a necessity. So this is about the news article and our Home Minister's speech at the conference. As a part of this discussion, let us continue to see some important points about NMFT. See, we already know NMFT is a ministerial conference and recently the third conference was concluded in India. Actually, the third conference was held in New Delhi. Remember, the first such conference was held in Paris 2018 and the second conference was held in 2019 in Melbourne, Australia. Now, coming to the objectives of this conference, see, as the name indicates, the NMFT aims at counter international terror financing by ensuring cooperation among the countries. So this is about the NMFT. Now let us see the various issues raised by India in the 2022 NMFT conference. Firstly, India indirectly attacked Pakistan by mentioning about the terrorist safe havens. In this, India mentioned that the world nations should not ignore the countries that support and finance terror activities. Here, India also mentioned that some countries support terrorist activity as part of their foreign policy. So, India suggested that there must be a monetary penalty imposed upon countries that support terrorism. Then, India mentioned about the regime change in Afghanistan. India said that due to the recent regime change in Afghanistan, the region's security is affected. After that, India mentioned about the issue of emerging technology. See, according to India, the emergence of dark net and cryptocurrency has made the prevention of terror financing complicated. In addition to this, there is also the issue of online radicalization of youth through the internet. So, India mentioned about all these and finally, while talking about the organized crime, India mentioned that organized crime and terror must not be seen isolation. 
India reiterated money made by the elements of the organized crime through gun running, drug peddling and smuggling is pumped into terrorism. So to counter terrorism, countering organized crimes is also a necessity. So these are all some of the important points that are mentioned by India in the NMFT conference. These are all the points that you have to make note of as well. See, whenever question arises from internal security or security in general, you can mention all these points in your mains answer writing. These points will enhance your answers. So in this news article discussion, we saw in detail about NMFT conference and we saw how India used this conference to counter terrorism. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. See the article states that the Uday has simplified the procedure for the prisoners to avail Aadhaar card. Actually, the Uday has agreed to accept the prisoner induction document as a valid document for Aadhaar enrollment or update. This prisoner induction document can be generated from the e-prison module and this has to be certified by the authorized prison officer. Here you have to take a note of this news article because UPSA has asked questions related to Aadhaar several times. For example, take this question from 2018. It is a two statement question. The first statement says that Aadhaar card can be used as a proof of citizenship or domicile. Second statement says that once issued Aadhaar number cannot be deactivated or omitted by the issuing authority. So here you have to choose the correct answer. So here what is the correct answer for the question? It is option D. Yes, both the statements are incorrect. Statement 1 is wrong because according to Government of India and Uday, Aadhaar is not a proof of citizenship. Now, statement 2 is also wrong because Aadhaar Act regulations state that an individual's Aadhaar number may be omitted permanently or deactivated temporarily by the Uday. The new information that we learned today can be used as a statement in your examination. So, once again, make note of this news article. So now, as part of this discussion, let us see some points about the e-prison module. First, look at this image to understand the roles played by the e-prison module. Basically, e-prisons computerize and integrate all the activities related to prison and prisoner management in the jail. Since all the data are digitized and stored in the cloud officials of the criminal justice system, mainly the prisoner officials can access the information regarding the inmates lodged in the prison in real time. Remember, this is developed by the National Informatics Center NIA of Ministry of Electronics and IT. Now, if you find time, just visit the ePrison web portal. There you can find a UI like this. Once you register with the ePrison, you can make a prison visit request online. You can buy products produced in the prison through Kara Bazaar and support the inmates. There is also a grievance redressal part. In addition to this, the e-prison also provides us with various data. For example, look at this dashboard which can be accessed in the e-prison portal. This dashboard provides various information about the prison that is available for the public to monitor. So finally, to conclude, we can say that the e-prison is developed as a common platform for the analysis and exchange of information among all the pillars of the criminal justice system comprising police, forensic, prosecution, courts and prisons. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about e-prison module. We saw that it is a web portal that integrates all the activities related to prison and prisoner management in the jail. And then we saw that this portal was developed by the National Informatics Center NIA of Ministry of Electronics and IT. Then we saw some of the applications of this e-prison. You can buy the products produced in the prison through Kara Bazaar and support the inmates. There is a grievance redressal part. And once you register with the e-prison, you can even make a prison visit request online. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. This news article is about PM Kisan scheme. The article shows some data regarding the PM Kisan scheme that was accessed using the right to information query. 
Now, before understanding the data given in the article, let us first make ourselves familiar with the PM Kisan scheme. It is nothing but the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi, which is shortly known as PM Kisan scheme. Here, Pradhan Mantri, as we know, means Prime Minister, Kisan means farmer, Samman means respectful or dignified, and Nidhi means fund. So basically, this scheme aims at ensuring the welfare of the farmers by providing them a dignified fund. So when was it launched? The scheme was launched by our Prime Minister in February 2019. Remember that the scheme is an income support scheme for the farmers. It is 100% funded by the centre and it is implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. This scheme promises cash benefit of rupees 6000 per annum. It is payable in three installments. That is, 2000 rupees is paid during each installment. Important significance of this scheme is that the amount is transmitted through direct benefit transfer mode. Now, who are all the beneficiaries of the scheme? See, the PM Kisan scheme aims to improve income support to the small and marginal farmer families who have combined land holding or ownership of up to 2 hectares. Here, 2 hectares is approximately 5 acres. Also, note the word ownership. This scheme does not cover the tenants or sharecroppers. Okay? It only covers small and marginal land owners. But this itself is a critical shortcoming of this scheme. See, just now I said that the scheme is 100% funded by the central government, right? But who identifies the beneficiaries? The beneficiaries of this scheme will be identified not by the central government, but by the respective state and administration of union territories. So note this point carefully. Now let us see some of the benefits of the scheme. Firstly, the scheme ensures an assured supplemented income to the vulnerable farmer families. Secondly, the scheme helps the farmers escape from the cluster of money lenders. For example, consider this. Normally before the harvest season, the farmers need money for employing laborers, lending harvesters, etc. Right? This compels them to borrow money from the local money lenders, which in turn pushes them into a debt trap. So this scheme aims to prevent the farmers from falling into the debt trap. Another merit of this scheme is that under the PM Kisan scheme, the fund is transferred directly to the beneficiary account which avoids leakages and ensures timely delivery of funds. Despite all these benefits, the scheme is currently facing a crisis. This is what is revealed in the news article here. As we saw earlier, the scheme was launched in 2019. We also saw that each year the amount for the farmer will be paid in three installments, right? So in four years, that is between 2019 to 2022, 12 installments have to be paid by the central government. The latest installment was paid on October 17 this year. The news article compares the number of beneficiaries covered in the first installment and the number of beneficiaries covered in the 11th installment. Between the first and 11th installment, the number of beneficiaries has fallen by 67%. This is according to Agriculture Ministry data. Now look at this data. The decline in the number of beneficiaries was different among different states. For example, in case of Madhya Pradesh, between the first and 11th installment, there is a 99% decline in beneficiaries. Another example is West Bengal. In West Bengal, in 2019, around 45 lakh people benefited from the scheme. But since the 6th installment, no farmers got the money. So some farmers are worried that the center is trying to slowly wind up this scheme. So that is all you have to know about this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about PM Kisan scheme. It is an income support scheme for the farmer. It is 100% funded by the center and it is implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare. The scheme promises cash benefit of 6000 rupees per annum payable in three installments. That is, rupees 2000 is paid during each installment. Now, the critical shortcoming of this scheme is that the beneficiaries of the scheme will not be identified by the central government but by the respective state and administration of union territories. 
then we saw what the data says with respect to decline in the beneficiaries of the scheme so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion see this article here this article is taken from yesterday's newspaper the news is that the day before yesterday india's first privately developed rocket vikram s lifted off from isro's launch pad in sri harikota the mission was named praram which literally means the beginning and this mission marks the india's private sector's first entry into the promising space launch market so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn some of the facts about vikram s rocket and the mission from the prelims perspective see the vikram s rocket has been developed by hyderabad based sky route aerospace a private company that was started in 2018 here the rocket was developed with support from the indian space research organization that is isro and indian national space promotion and authorization center in space know that in space is an autonomous agency which functions under the department of space it is the regulatory for the private sector space industry in india so now coming back the vikram s rocket is named as vikram sarabhai who is the founder of india's space program the vikram s is a single stage and solid fueled sub orbital launch vehicle here sub orbital flight or those vehicles which are traveling slower than the orbital velocity meaning it is fast enough to reach outer space but not fast enough to stay in an orbit around the earth so it was developed by incorporating advanced technologies including carbon composite structures and 3d printed components it is equipped with a gross lift off mass of 545 kg and payload mass of 80 kg the vikram s launch vehicle is powered by kalam 80 propulsion system know that the engine is named after former president dr apj abdul kalam now talking about the praram mission See so under the mission Praram the Vikram S rocket carried three payloads including one satellite named FunSat See FunSat was developed by Space Kids India It is a Chennai based aerospace startup Know that the part of FunSat were developed by school students The Praram mission was a technology demonstration flight to showcase the capabilities of Skyroot company Also this mission will help to validate the technologies incorporated in the vikram s rocket see the validation and the testing of the technologies will help in the future mission of the sky route know that sky route has also been in the process of developing three variants of vikram rocket the one is vikram 1 it can carry 480 kg payload to low inclination orbit and it can carry 290 kg payload to sspo that is sun synchronous polar orbits The second one is the Vikram 2. It can carry 595 kg payload to low inclination orbit and 400 kg payloads to sun synchronous polar orbits. And finally Vikram 3, it can carry 815 kg payload to low inclination orbit and 560 payloads to SSPS. Now here there is a task for you. Find and comment the types of orbit that is used for placing a satellite or spacecraft if you can mention the difference between all the orbit it is well and good now take this as a task and comment it in the comment section so in this news article discussion we saw in detail about vikram s which is india's first privately developed rocket it was developed by hyderabad based sky route aerospace a private company that was started in 2018 and this vikram s is a single staged and solid fueled sub orbital launch vehicle so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now for our final discussion let us take up this news article see recently the tribal development council of andaman and nicobar island had sent an application to the geographical indications registry at chennai and the application is seeking the geographical indication that is gi tag for the nicobari hodi boat so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn few facts about hodi boat from the prelims perspective see the hodi is considered as one of the nicobari tribes traditional crafts It is a type of canoe. A canoe 
is a small narrow boat that move through the water it moves with the help of sticks with a wide end called a paddle hodi is very commonly operated in the nicobar group of islands mostly hodis are considered as an asset of tuhet here the term tuhet refers to a group of families controlled by a leader called headman See, hodis are used for transporting people and goods from one island to another, and people also use hodis for fishing and racing purposes. Know that hodi races are held between island and villages, and it is celebrated in a grand manner every year. The hodi race helps in preserving the traditional culture of Nicobaris and paves way for cultural interaction. And the race also helps in promoting brotherhood among the Nicobari tribe. Now talking about its size the size of hodi varies according to the purpose of which it is built firstly small to medium size hodis its overall length ranging from 3 to 9 meter and they are used for fishing then the bigger size hodis its overall length exceeding from 10 meter and they are used exclusively for racing purposes so this is about the hodi boat Now let us look into the process involved in making the hodi boat. See the technical skills involved in building a hodi boat are based on indigenous knowledge. The knowledge is inherited by the Nicobari tribes from their forefathers. The hodi is built using either locally available tree or from nearby island and its design varies slightly from island to island. A well experienced tribal carpenter along with his team used to visit dense forest of the island to identify the tree suitable for the construction of hodi not that the tree has to be free of big branches along the required length also the tree should be sufficiently wide in girth to provide for the desired width to make a hodi boat mostly a 60 to 80 year old tree with a straight trunk or the tree which have a slight incline to one side is preferred so once the choice is made permission is obtained from the owner of the tree and the tree is felled using an axe and hand saw then the next process involves cutting and scooping of the trunk at required length once the trunk is cut then it is shaped heated and polished then the cross bars and outriggers are fixed finally the stability of hodi board is checked and it will be inducted into the waters so that is all you have to know about this hodi boards so in this news article discussion we saw in detail about hodi boards for which the tribal development council of andaman and nicobar island had sent an application seeking gi tag so with all these learnt points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now look at this first question let me read out the question for you with reference to prisoner induction document consider the following statements statement 1 it is a document required by ministry of home affairs for the other enrollment or update of the prisoners statement 2 prisoner induction document can be generated from the e prison module you have to choose the correct statement here option a one only option b two only option c both one and two and option d neither one nor two so the correct answer for the question is option b two only statement one is actually wrong Prisoner induction document is a document required by Uday for other enrollment or updation of the prisoner. So this statement is actually wrong. Now second statement is actually correct. We saw that in our discussion itself, right? So the correct answer for this question is option B, two only. Now moving on, look at this question about invoice. Statement one, it is functioning under the Ministry of Science and Technology. Statement two, it provides daily advisories to fisher communities to help them easily locate areas of abundant fish in the ocean. Here also, you have to choose the correct answer. Here, the correct answer for the question is option B, two only. First statement is incorrect because INCOIS is an autonomous organization which is functioning under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. We saw that in our discussion itself, right? So the first statement is incorrect. Now here the second statement is actually correct Incois provides daily advisories to fisher communities which help them to easily locate the areas of abundant fish in the ocean this also helps the fisheries to save both fuel and time used to search for the fishes we saw that in the discussion itself right so the correct answer for this question is option B to only now moving on look at this question 
which among the following are the similarities between PM Kisan and Kisan credit card scheme. Statement 1. Both help address the post-harvest and working capital needs of the farmer. Statement 2. Both help farmers from falling into the debt trap. And Statement 3. Both provides low-cost credit to the farmers. So here the correct answer for the question is option A 1 and 2 only. Statement 3 is incorrect. Here know that Kisan credit card scheme was launched in the year 1998. Kisan credit card scheme aims at providing adequate and timely credit support from the banking system to the farmer to help address their short term credit needs. This is provided to give working capital to the farmers and help them during post harvest time. As we saw in the discussion, PM Kisan also helped them during post-harvest time, thereby providing working capital. So, statement 1 is correct. Now, statement 2 is also correct because as both PM Kisan and Kisan credit card prevent the farmer from falling into debt trap, statement 2 is correct. Statement 3 is incorrect because Kisan credit card provides low-cost credit or loan to farmers but in PM Kisan the government just pays the farmers 6000 rupees every year. So here the correct answer for the question is option A 1 and 2 only. Now moving on look at this question about Vikram S. Statement 1 it is India's first privately developed launch vehicle. Statement 2 it is a two stage sub orbital launch vehicle. Statement 3 it is equipped with a gross lift of mass of more than 1000 kg. You have to choose the incorrect statement here. Here statement 2 and 3 are incorrect because Vikram S is a single staged and solid fuel sub orbital launch vehicle. It is not two staged. Statement 3 is incorrect because Vikram S is equipped with a gross lift off mass of 545 kg and payload of 80 kg. And statement 1 as we saw in the discussion itself it is correct actually. So here the correct answer for the question is option B 2 and 3 only because both 2 and 3 are incorrect. Now look at this final question. This final question is about Hody boat. The term Hody boat often seen in news belongs to which of the following state or union territory? Option A, Kerala. Option B, Andaman and Nicobar. Option C, Assam. And option D, Lakshwadeep. See the correct option for the question is option B, Andaman and Nicobar. This is a very simple question. But suddenly when it appears in UPSC preliminary question paper, we might get panic and lose it out. But it is a very simple question. Okay. Now moving on, these two questions displayed here or the quiz question for you today just go through the question if you could not answer the question go back to our video listen it again so that you can easily answer the question displayed here post the correct answer in the comment section the question displayed here is the mains practice question for you today just go through the question write an answer and post it in the comment section so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.